Thank you, Haven. That was a great song. And that was Nolan Aldred that read the scripture, so thank you to Nolan as well. You know, back in the day, when people were still allowed to go to church, Kimberly and I loved going to church. I mean, when we went on holidays, we loved going to church. Because we could go to a church and we could just sit and worship. We didn't have to do anything, we didn't have to lead anything, didn't have to play anything. I mean, as much as we love doing it, sometimes it's nice just to be able to go to church and sit with people. And oftentimes, when we would go to a church on a holiday, and I'd be sitting there with the people of this church that I didn't know, a question occurred to me consistently. Here's the question, why am I here? And as I looked around at people in the church, I'd think, hmm, I wonder why they're here. I wonder why that family's here. I'll, I'll put that question to you. Why did you tune in today? I think people gather in churches and now in COVID times tune into churches for different reasons. One reason could be that it's Sunday morning. It's just tradition. People come to church because it's just what you do on a Sunday morning. Other people come to church back in the day when we could gather because there are friends in the church. You see people, you have fellowship, you, you talk, you laugh, you have a coffee afterwards. Some people come to church, I think, or tune into church for their kids. Julia oversees that program and does such a great job. I think a lot of, I think a lot of young families are in church because they're children. They want their children to learn Bible teachings. I remember when my son Ian, Ian who is here, when Ian was probably three and Taylor was about one, I just knew that I wanted them to learn something about the Bible and we started going back to church. Some people might gather in a church or tune in to maybe to learn something. Maybe you're just curious, you have curious minds. You might say, I don't really know what I believe, but I'd like to learn about what the Bible teaches. There's different reasons why people gather in a church. Some people might come because they just want to do good in the world, and they see the church as being an avenue where they can do good in the world. It's just a way to, to help people. Some people come to church for the buffet. I mean, it's part of the deal. Mom says, you go to church, we get to go to the buffet after church. That's why they're here. They get to go to the buffet after church. I know lots of families. Well, not lots, but some. Maybe you have no idea why you're tuning in this morning or later in the week if you're watching this. Maybe you're guided by some higher power. You don't even understand that. Here's the main reason why most people gather in a church or tune into a live stream. See if you agree with this. Because people want to have a God experience. They want to tune into something, and after it's over, they want to say to themselves, it's true. God is real. They want to have some kind of glimpse of something holy. I think that that's the main reason why people gather in a church. And the fact is that God has promised that when we gather, He will be with us. Whenever one or two gather, I will be there with you. And we remember that promise in a song or in a prayer or in a word spoken or an act of fellowship. We gather in church and we tune in because we just want, we need that in our lives to just know that God is real and that there's just something beyond what we're living today. And so in this passage that Nolan read, Isaiah has this God experience, the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah, Jesus knew a lot about. Isaiah was a huge influence on Jesus. And, and, and in this passage, Isaiah has a God experience, but it's not just a glimpse of God. Isaiah has this face-to-face -face encounter with God. Don't you think that that would be the ultimate experience to have a face-to-face -face with God? Think about it. It would be the ultimate discovery. If you had a face-to-face -face with God, you would discover the answers to every mystery in the universe. Wouldn't that be just cool? I mean, we're living in difficult times. And, and we just have these questions, God, what, like, where is this going to lead to? 
Where is this, how is this uncertainty going to just continue to unfold? Like all of these mysteries would just be answered if we had a face-to-face. Like why are some people born with everything and other people born with nothing? Why are some people born with talent and intelligent and good? They just got, and other people have none of that. Why are some people born poor, other people born rich? All of these questions, like we would just have an answer to if we were face to face with God. It's like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. There will be a day when we'll see God clearly. Now, now our lives, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, our lives are like looking into a mirror that's foggy. But there will be a day when we'll see clearly. There'll be a day when we will see God face to face. Now, having a desire to see God face to face presumes something. It presumes that in some way that's going to be a good thing. Right? I mean, what if, what if someone is afraid to see God face to face? What if someone, sort of their, their whole image of God all their lives has been that God's a judge? You know, God's just got the big gavel. He's just waiting to slam his gavel down on you. Yet, I know what you did. And I am here now to sentence you because that's what justice is. You've done this. Now I'm going to sentence you. And somebody passes you an orange prison jumpsuit and you're thrown in a cell, throw away the key. Maybe that's what you think a face-to-face with God would bring. Or even worse, something like Dante's Inferno. That's a lot worse than a prison cell, like this place where people are just tortured for eternity. Maybe people are just afraid of a face-to-face with God. I had a friend in high school. He never wanted to go home. He never wanted to go home to where his dad was. I can remember we'd go out, we'd go out on, in the evening and do something, we'd play pool or something or whatever. And then around 11 o'clock, I'd say, I gotta go home, it's time to go. And he'd go, oh, let's just stay out a couple, he always just wanted to stay out because he was afraid of going home. Because his dad was always picking, his dad was always judging, his dad was always, there was just no grace with his father and he just never wanted to, to see his father. And I always felt sorry for him because when I went home, even if I messed something up, even if I dinged the car, I was never afraid of my father. I was never afraid of going home. And maybe that's how some people feel. Like a face-to-face with God is kind of like going home to see a father who's just waiting to condemn you for something. So this Isaiah passage... It just opens all of this right up. Isaiah comes face to face with God, according to the story. And we're like, well, what happened? I'd like to know what happened. That'd be interesting to know what happened when a human being comes face to face with God. Here's how Isaiah describes the face to face meeting with God. I'll just remind you of a couple of verses that Nolan read. I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. It's, it's like kind of a majestic image of God. It's kind of like when I'm thinking about God, I, I think that that might be what God would be sort of like on a throne, high up, and there's a temple, there's a robe flowing. I'm always envious of people who have these kinds of visions that are just so tactile. Because for me, God always just kind of whispers. It's never just a, a, a solid shout. I, mean, I know people who have had visions. I, I know a woman who had a vision of, of, she said Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary, came into her room and, and she was a smart, responsible, intelligent woman and I was just envious because I've never had anything like that. Isaiah has this, has this vision and it's just like an explosion of the fullness of God firing on all 10 cylinders and I'm just like, I would love that to happen to me. But then it gets bizarre. What happens next? Isaiah saw seraphs flying around. Seraphs were kind of like angelic, heavenly beings, and these had six wings. But they're flying around, and they're protecting themselves with their wings, as though the light is so bright it's going to hurt them, as though there's, there's almost like a heat. They're covering up their feet with their wings. Like, it's an intensity. And they're calling out these words, holy, holy, holy is God. And everything is filled with God's glory. You know, if I think about being in the fullness of the presence of God, I think about something peaceful. Kind of like Psalm 23, still waters, green pastures. 
Or that passage in, in Revelation of the lion laying down with the lamb, something like that. That's how I imagine the fullness of God to be. Or, or in Jesus' parable, the wedding banquet, where being with God is just like being at, like, almost like at a party where you're surrounded by loved ones. And it's like the best family reunion ever. These seraphs are flying around and there is this intensity about holy, holy, holy. Well, here's what Isaiah's response is to that. He cries out, woe is me, I'm ruined. What? Isaiah, come on, you're in the presence of God. It's face to face. What kind of a reaction is that? I don't understand. What Isaiah comes face to face with is not peaceful and it's not comfortable. What it is, is holy. Holy, holy, holy. Everything is filled with this, this glory. Isaiah then is in some kind of state of despair. Why? Because God is so huge? I don't think so. Maybe, but I don't think so. On a beautiful starry night, I can look up at the stars and I'm looking up at infinity and my brain doesn't understand what I'm looking at. It's too huge. But that doesn't fill me with despair. It fills me with awe. Or when a newborn baby is born, I don't understand the mystery of how that happens, how a new soul is... I, I don't, but it doesn't fill me with, with despair. Isaiah has before him this huge mystery. And, but, but yet somehow he's filled with despair. Why? Maybe call, being called into the presence of something powerful that is a ruthless tyrant would be a horrible thing. Like if you're called into the principal's office, if you ever were when you were a kid, you can remember that feeling. Or called, when the Jews were called into a meeting with, with the SS, the Nazi leadership, they were filled with despair in the presence of that power, but only because that was a ruthless, horrible power. And they knew that death was imminent. That's not the case with Isaiah. His fear doesn't come because God is a ruthless tyrant. Isaiah's fear comes because God is holy. So what does that mean? What does it mean that there is a holiness that intense to cause somebody to, to sort of almost recoil and say, woe is me, woe is me, I'm ruined. Well, we have glimpses of holiness in this life. When Dan Rather, in 1982, traveled to Calcutta to see Mother Teresa's orphanage, he just couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe the poverty in Calcutta. He couldn't believe that this, this little orphanage was in the middle of the city, and all these kids had no parents, and they had this staff of people that were taking care of them all. And Mother Teresa said, you know, you help the world by helping one child at a time. And Dan Rather said, I was so humbled he said, I don't live my life like that. Like, I haven't given myself to the world in the way these people have. And he said, I was so humbled in the presence of this place that I, th I saw was just being holy. Glimpses of the holy. I have a friend who's a minister in Wilmington, North Carolina. And he just told us two weeks ago that he was leaving his church, it's a beautiful big church, Presbyterian, upper middle class. He said, I'm leaving that church to go work with gangs in, in the town of Wilmington. Gangs, like black and Latino gangs. People are like, really? You're leaving the church to work with gangs? Couldn't believe it. Have you ever heard of a name, James Barnett? James Barnett, probably not. James Barnett was uh, raised in Georgia middle class family, upper middle class family, raised in the church, and went to Harvard, and halfway through Harvard, uh, he took a trip to Nicaragua with a church group. And when they went to Nicaragua, they went to a dump, a garbage dump, where people lived. He said 2,000 people lived in this garbage dump. And after he took that trip, he went back home, and he gave up everything he had to live with the homeless people in the state of Georgia. And then he built a, a, a Clothe Your Neighbor, is, is a program that 20 years later is still running. Clothe Your Neighbor. Now let me ask you a question. 
How do those stories make you feel, hearing those stories? Do you find them inspiring? If so, inspiring enough for you to do the same? Do you know what I think? I think when we hear those stories, we're like, I'm never going to be able to do that. I'm never going to be able to sell everything I own and, and, and live with the homeless. I'm probably not, not going to be able to just walk away from everything I have and, and start working with street gangs. I'm just not going to be able to do it. I know I'm not going to be able to. And there's a sense of despair that we feel knowing that we may never be able to reach that level of love. Isaiah's reaction to being face to face with God was despair. Why? Because God is the ultimate culmination of all of those earthly glimpses of holiness and heaven. Being face to face with God brings the fullness, the fullness of love for neighbor, the pinnacle of self sacrifice and purity. And in the presence of that, Isaiah sees for the very first time who he is and who his people are. Like this is the pinnacle of everything anybody could ever do. This is the throne of God. And the agony that Isaiah feels comes from finally seeing how far he and his people have fallen short of God's love. I don't know if you've ever felt like that before in the midst of things that people do to create holy places as they help people who need help. Now, if it ended there, it'd be dark and it'd be sad. But what happens next is amazing. What happens next is gospel. What happens next is why the Bible is called good news. What happens next is transformational. And it's crucial for our understanding of who we are and who God is. Because what happens next moves Isaiah from woe is me, from a place of despair into a place of joy. It moves him from the dark to the light. And this movement happens all through the Bible and is the principal message of the Bible and of Jesus Christ. Isaiah has seen who he really is, standing in this blinding light of God. He's just covering up because it's just too perfect and it's too pure and things are looking bleak. But here's what Isaiah does. Here's what Isaiah does. He says this, for I'm a man of unclean lips. This is how he responds to perfect love. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Do you know what that is? That's a confession. Like all he does, all he's doing is just admitting who he is. Like he finally sees the truth about how far he's fallen short of what God has called him to do, and he is actually just articulating it. He's saying it. The Bible word for that is repentance. He's being repentant which is kind of a huge part of Jesus' teaching. Look, it's okay to mess up. We all mess up, but just confess the, the mistake. See it for what it is and admit it, and then try to do better. Like Paul says in that famous passage in, in Romans 7, I know that I am called to do good, but I cannot do it. What a wretched man am I. He's just... He's, he's articulating this inability to reach this perfect level of love. In theory, that's easy to understand, repentance. But we get stubborn, don't we? Ah, oh, we get stubborn when it comes to admitting fault. We get stubborn in our marriages. We get stubborn in our friendships. And if we have any kind of prayer relationship with God, we get stubborn when it comes to admitting who we are and what we've done. Well, Isaiah finds a way to get there, obviously. And here's what God says to Isaiah after he repents. I will touch your lips and your guilt will be taken away. 
So many parables that Jesus taught are all about that. Your guilt will be... That's, that's what God does that moves the despair into joy, the darkness into light. God, God forgives. There's grace. Your guilt will be taken away. It's the grace of God given to Isaiah, given to us. See, when Paul says, why can I not do the good that I know I'm called to do? He doesn't end there. He doesn't end saying that, what a wretched man I am, like Isaiah says, woe is me. He doesn't end there. He says, thank God for the grace of Jesus Christ, for that grace has saved me. It's the grace that saves us from our inability to reach the kind of love that we're called to reach. It's grace. It's the most important teaching that Jesus brings into the world. That when we fall short, God does not condemn us. When we're face to face with God, there is no condemnation. It's not over yet, because here's Isaiah's response to that grace. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? God's kind of sitting there on his throne going, Look, I need some help. You know, I need uh, anybody going to volunteer to help me out here? Whom shall I send? There's things that ha- have to happen in the world. Who will go for us? And, and Isaiah's like, Here I am, send me. See, Isaiah is just so thankful. Because Isaiah knows now that face to face with God is not going to produce condemnation. He's just so thankful knowing that like when you go home, you don't have a father that's going to condemn you. You have a father that loves you. He's not afraid of going home. And he's just so happy about that that his only response is just to say, I want to try to help out. I want to try to use my life to make a good difference in the world. Like, if you knew for certain that God was this God, a God of grace who would just forgive you, not only for what you've done, but even for things that you're going to do all in the future that you don't even know about yet, because God is a God of grace and mercy, you will be forgiven for how far you fall short. Like, if you knew that for certain, wouldn't you want to just give your life in a spirit of thankfulness? Here I am. I'll do what I can. I'll do what I can to be a light into the world. God, send me. Send me. So when God asks the question, whom will I send to be my voice to the world, Isaiah is eager to say, send me. I'll do what I can. So here's the question we finish with. If you had a chance to experience what Isaiah experienced and go face to face with God, would you? If the answer is yes, It's not just the effect that that would have on you. It's the effect on all the people around you who need someone in their lives that is sent by God. You see, that becomes you. You become the person they need sent by God. Here I am. Because friends, God knows in this world around us right now, There are people that need that help. Amen. I'm going to call Ian and Haven and Kimberly uh, back up. And this is a song that sings these very words. Here I am, Lord.